to ask questions about evolution. Uh, and you've, you've been responsible for some, uh, for some very interesting meetings at Santa Barbara, which is, I think, kind of the ins one of the inspirations, maybe, for, for what we're doing here. So, thank you. Well, it's a great pleasure and uh, also a bit of a challenge because uh, uh, I really wish I was here from the very beginning and uh, this way I would uh, have a much better understanding of where uh, all of you are and where all of us are. And, uh, but uh, anyway, so uh, hopefully with your questions and uh, my uh, attempt to, uh, to be flexible, we can uh, sort of uh, synchronize a little bit. So my assignment was to uh, present you with uh, uh, sort of statistical physics views of evolution. Uh, I don't know if I can uh, actually manage that, but uh, I will at least hope to present a statistical physicist's view of evolution. And uh, roughly, um, um, again, because uh, I don't quite know um, what uh, um, you've been doing this, uh, this week, uh, I will uh, start with uh, a little bit of a review of uh, basic elements just to get us to use the same uh, language. And, uh, well, again, uh, I guess uh, repetition is the mother of learning. And uh, um, maybe at least I'll give you a little bit uh, something that you already know from a different angle, and that might be useful. And most of all, uh, uh, please uh, don't hesitate to fast forward me, and uh, uh, I will try to do it myself. And uh, my other uh, uh, assignment was to try to present you with uh, uh, some uh, big picture view, which uh, uh, one really shouldn't uh, probably ever ask me to do because, uh, um, you know, Oscar here was uh, uh, doing heavy lifting of actually telling you about facts. And uh, if you start asking me for a big picture, I will uh, sort of go off into a land of dreams. So, but uh, I threw in so a couple of uh, philosophical interludes that I normally wouldn't. And uh, I guess we'll also use this as a little bit of an opportunity to, uh, to provoke. So, um, but uh, uh, Oscar with uh, uh, the heavy lifting has uh, set up uh, much of uh, the story that uh, I want to tell you. For example, he was talking about uh, this little model of uh, a sex asexual adaptation as a traveling wave. And, uh, uh, I'm going to take you through this in a little bit more detail. And in part two, we will uh, uh, go from asexual to sexual, or at least sometimes sexual, i.e. Um, um, things like uh, yeast and uh, plants that do not have to outcross in order to um, uh, make babies all the time. And then recombination is sort of facultative. It occurs only every so often and, in fact, becomes um, a parameter. It becomes a tunable knob. In this case, not only a knob in the model, but uh, an evolutionary knob. Uh, so we'll uh, talk about uh, interplay of genetic interactions and uh, recombination. And... Uh, um, Okay, let's uh, jump in. So we very often think of evolution, certainly that's how it's viewed in uh, um, um, you know, the press, as uh, something that looks into the past that has to do with uh, the origins and then we observe the leaves and if we want to find common ancestors, we have to go and uh, uh, dig in... Uh, 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 sedimental rock. Um, but uh, uh, the excitement that uh, I think uh, has attracted quite a few physicists, yeah, this is my statistical physics connection here, um, to, 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 the few, to the subject is that these days there's completely different kind of uh, the data. So, of course, evolution is a dynamical process and uh, um, 
with the sort of fast evolving bugs, such as RNA viruses uh, like HIV, uh, the dynamics of evolution is basically um, the, the development of the disease itself. And uh, there is a kind of, uh, there's data like this that uh, uh, basically represents, uh, uh, presents a tree constructed from genomic sequence, geno genomic samples of uh, HIV uh, harvested from blood samples of a single patient over the course of, uh, well, what, about 14 years here. So every half a year, the um, patient uh, went to the clinic, blood sample was taken, and uh, eventually viruses uh, extracted and sequenced, at least some of them. And uh, then based on uh, sequence, sequence relatedness, a tree was reconstructed. And the striking feature was that uh, initially, there was very little diversity. There was basically one strain of virus identified in blood, but uh, very rapidly, there was a great burst of uh, diversification, and that went on and on and on uh, as uh, time progressed in this chronic disease. And there, there is a fair bit of uh, data of the sort. Invariably, one sees a great deal of sequence divergence. So basically, between these early strains and late, late strains, there's almost 10% divergence, i.e. 10% of all the nucleotides in uh, this uh, um, sequenced, sequenced segment of uh, the virus actually got uh, substituted. So that, that's amazing. To see that much diversity, um, you know, or rather that much divergence um, in uh, Drosophila, would, uh, um, you would have to look at uh, species uh, separated by uh, you know, 100 million years. And, excuse me? Oh, I'm sorry, two, many. Why did I say 100? Many. Uh, in any case, million years. Uh, so here you, uh, see that much divergence occur basically in a single patient over a very uh, short period of time. And of course, it is driven by uh, the competition between uh, the virus and uh, the immune system. The immune system is uh, uh, constantly uh, <coughs> developing uh, a sort of affinity for the virus. It recognizes the virus, kills it. And the virus then is under pressure to change the antigens uh, and escape the detection from the immune system. Uh, so that, that's uh, one mechanism. In fact, th that was uh, operating at the time of the experiment um, that was done. So these days, actually, um, it is hard to come up with uh, data of that sort because patients get treated. And uh, um, uh, instead, we're doing uh, effectively a different kind of uh, experiments. Now, the virus has to compete, um, or rather evolve to acquire drug resistance. So in this particular case, I'm showing uh, the sequence of uh, amino acid of uh, drug sensitive um, strain and uh, another sequence now which is drug resistant. And you see quite a few substitutions. And the remarkable thing here is that uh, uh, well, clearly, not all of these substitutions are required for resistance, but uh, typically many are. And, uh, and it is actually essential for the drug to actually be uh, effective, that uh, it would require multiple substitutions in order to be defeated. So, and uh, the challenge, of course, is... Uh, that uh, this RNA virus is mutating very fast. So this uh, mutational rate times uh, genome length cor cor corresponds to, what, about 0.3 uh, mutations per genome generation. And uh, the viral load in an untreated patient is uh, rather gigantic. So there's a large number of viruses. Uh, excuse me? The generation time is, uh, well, actually, I think it depends on conditions, depends on the cell type, but uh, roughly two days. At least that's in the cell culture. So, 
Uh, okay. So with this mutation rate and population size, basically every single substitution in the genome is tried in a single generation. In fact, every pair of substitutions is tried in a single generation. Right? So the drug that takes only two mutations to, uh, to beat is virtually worthless. Right? So that's basically the idea behind the uh, you know, drug cocktail. So you want to apply multiple drugs to make uh, sort of an evolutionary landscape for, for the virus uh, a little bit more um, complex. the literature where they're saying like this is the drug resistance mutation and they absolutely don't talk about the rest what's going do you have any sense of what's going on there well so th there is actually a fair bit of uh, of uh, knowledge that there is a, a whole database of uh, resistant strains and uh, there is uh, some repertory of uh, uh, um, substitutions that uh, 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 contribute to resistance, and uh, one is actually trying to enumerate um, these different combinations, and uh, uh, there's sort of an active study of these uh, mutational landscapes, and uh, uh, there, there's very nice data available in this field because uh, people actually reconstruct strains, adding one substitution at a time, and then measure the effect, and uh, there, there's nice quantitative data that one can actually try to address the question of uh, reconstructing uh, this uh, uh, fitness, in that case, drug resistance um, uh, or drug susceptibility landscape as you add more, more generation. Right? So, how long, how long on average does it take typically for a patient when they get so infected to become resistant? Do they know that? Well, I think in practice it's, uh, well, it depends on the drug. Okay, right? I, I understand it. Um, well, and the, so standard, okay, strictly speaking, uh, I should just say that I don't really know this in enough detail to give you uh, a good answer. So I'll, uh, okay, I'll. So, uh, uh, Pluny Pennings at Stanford has, has done a lot of this, right? You, and uh, I think <coughs> they find that a lot of times it happens right away, practically. That it's already in the standing diversity in the population, the, the drug resistance mutations. Um, that if it doesn't happen right away, it can take, uh, I think, months to years. I well, think. it depends, uh, depends on the drug, and it depends yeah. on, uh, on the treatment, yeah. right? And of course, the treatments are designed to uh, sort of uh, maximize the time. So if you ask, uh, uh, you know, what does it take in the clinical uh, setting, the answer is, I don't know. So, okay, so uh, this is not the whole story. Um, um, not everybody uh, um, knows that uh, uh, HIV engages in a kind of a viral uh, sex of, uh, of its own. So it's an RNA uh, virus in order to proceed with its life cycle. It has to uh, um, copy uh, it's RNA into DNA. There is a reverse transcriptase that uh, does the job. It binds uh, uh, RNA templates, starts making uh, a DNA copy, but it's a bit sloppy, so it falls off. It falls off while holding on to um, this partially copied DNA. And then it reloads another RNA strand and just picks up where it uh, stopped. So as long as uh, um, <coughs> there is only one type of a template in uh, uh, the cell, uh, it will uh, right, make a faithful copy. But if the cell is multiply infected, then there is a chance that it will uh, pick up the other strand, right? and the babies will come off as uh, mosaics. Of, of the two different strands. So that is exactly the same uh, uh, outcome as uh, um, so the outcome of familiar sex and, uh, and recombination. Basically taking uh, different strains and uh, uh, bringing um, sort of genetic uh, polymorphisms 
from different strains onto the same genome. And, uh, uh, and again, in the context of uh, this problem, basically understanding the rate of acquisition of uh, drug resistance as a function of uh, okay, mutation rate. Well, mutation rate, uh, you don't change very much, but uh, 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 the size of viral population in the patient is certainly itself success uh, susceptible to the drug level. So you may ask, uh, is it worth increasing the drug dose to um, completely um, uh, suppress um, the population size? So how much uh, does uh, the rate of drug, um, um, rate of evolution of drug resistance depend on uh, the population size? And uh, um, this is going to depend also on uh, the role of uh, recombination here, since, uh, uh, of course, the probability of uh, uh, multiple infection itself is uh, at least a quadratic function of uh, 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 viral density. So uh, I guess this is my, uh, my big picture slide. So I just, uh, on two previous slides, uh, gave uh, kind of two views of evolution. Evolution looking at uh, the origins, looking at the past, and uh, evolution um, of, uh, right, as uh, the dynamical process uh, defining the future as in acquisition of drug resistance, for example. And uh, um, this uh, dynamics, uh, as has been said, can only be understood in the context of uh, population genetics, uh, which describes the spreading of alleles in populations. But uh, uh, it is, of course, directly related to uh, you know, molecular and systems biology and genetics, which actually defines the uh, phenotype-genotype uh, relation. Now, all of biology can be, uh, you might say, captured in this one function, relation of phenotype to the genotype. And uh, um, when Oscar uh, was uh, discussing distribution of uh, um, uh, mutation effects, right, on some level, this is uh, a molecular genetics question and systems uh, biology question. Um, um, what do we know about the effects of tweaking uh, this biological system? What effect, uh, how many ways are there to uh, affect a given genotype, be it uh, um, um, drug sensitivity or you know, height or oil content? And uh, then, of course, there is uh, ecology, which uh, defines actually the notion of, uh, of fitness. It defines uh, what selective pressures there are in uh, acting on this uh, organism, and in fact, whether there are some additional ways of avoiding this selection uh, pressures, as uh, I think Monty uh, um, mentioned. So uh, the dream of uh, a statistical physicist is uh, then somehow to unify these uh, you know, three lines of uh, inquiries, distilling the uh, essence, let me call this statistical genetics, which uh, um, would allow predicting the evolutionary future in some statistical sense. So by this I mean uh, uh, actually understanding the distribution of uh, mutational effects, uh, understanding how um, likely we are to find uh, sort of lots of small jumps or perhaps uh, few very, very big jumps. Understand, uh, no, uh, at least on some uh, statistical level, uh, so the likelihood 
of, uh, or rather the effect of a changing environment and uh, have, uh, um, again, so this is just the, sort of the dream of uh, statistical prediction. What, um, I mean, yeah. You, just in terms of like tractability, I mean, what do you think about prediction versus just understanding historical data? Well, uh, you know, I'm very much for uh, trying to predict in a sense that this is uh, sort of both useful and it's an ultimate, uh, ultimate uh, uh, test of our understanding. So, and you, you can split this into two parts. So one is uh, predicting the outcome of a nice controlled lab experiment where there is no way for the bug to uh, escape uh, selective pressure. Even though, you know, even the chemostat, they uh, uh, find ways to, you know, stick to the walls and, uh, you know, beat, beat the experimentalists. But, uh, but I guess what, the, what I mean by this maybe is uh, um, less that my, might uh, um, uh, meet the eye. Um, I guess I would say... Uh, uh, I'd be willing to uh, settle for very little. Um, so think of weather prediction. So uh, trying to predict the weather from uh, you know first principles, you know solving uh, turbulence, uh, atmosphere, ocean interactions. Uh, this is hard, uh, but. Uh, Forecasting works reasonably well, and the way forecasting uh, works is uh, uh, basically with a telephone and a windsock. And, uh, and the way it works is, uh, you know, you look out there, you see the cloud, you see that the wind is blowing our way, and you can predict. And of course, there's a probability that uh, the wind direction will change between today and tomorrow, and then you won't predict terribly well. But uh, but I guess the challenge here is can, by combining all of these uh, strands of thought, can we uh, devise sort of population genetics equivalent of, uh, of a windsock? Just what exactly do we need to detect, say, by looking at uh, um, um, uh, genomic samples from uh, 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 some existing population. What should we be looking for to make some statement about what, uh, what uh, um, uh, will be faced tomorrow? So, uh, I'm not really keeping track of the time. Yeah, like 15 minutes. Yeah. Okay, so these are obvious questions. Let me um, talk a little bit. Okay, so a little bit of review, right? So this is uh, our population in a given time. Beneficial mutation comes in, and uh, its offspring are more successful at surviving, and uh, they replace uh, their uh, uh, unmutated uh, cousins, and uh, uh, this beneficial mutation fixates. Uh, that is to say, uh, uh, takes over the whole population. But uh, then uh, um, before it will fixate, fixate, it has to overcome stochastic fluctuations, which will dominate its dynamics at uh, short times. Um, I'm sure you've heard about uh, this in uh, the course of, uh, of the week. And... Uh, uh, the stochastic dynamics, also known as uh, genetic drift, uh, is uh, very well understood since uh, sort of neutral theory of uh, uh, Kimura. And uh, there's another way of thinking about this process basically as stochastic branching. Right? At any given uh, uh, time, an individual, that for an individual in the population, there is some probability of uh, having, let's say, two offspring. Uh, surviving in uh, the next generation, or perhaps one, or perhaps 
zero, and the variations on uh, um, uh, this sort of model will all produce more or less the same results. And what one looks at, for example, is extinction probability. And what one finds is, uh, for neutral theory, um, uh, this probability approaches one as a function of time. Uh, and one can uh, uh, generalize this and uh, calculate the probability of uh, uh, a given individual to have n offspring after t generations. And uh, um, there one finds a very simple um, so exponential distribution um, with uh, uh, expected number of offspring conditional, conditional on survival, actually increasing linearly with uh, time. So that basically means that uh, uh, right, while most of the population, so this is n as a function of time, so while most, uh, in most cases, there'll be no offspring at all, there'll be um, in the case where there are survivors after time t, the expected number of copies is of order t. So it's actually a rather interesting and, uh, and uh, useful result. Uh, uh, so there are these sort of large fluctuations in, uh, in the process. And uh, uh, um, so intuitively it then uh, is uh, uh, immediately obvious that uh, the probability for the offspring to take over the whole population, that basically means have the number of offspring um, equal to population size, right? So we're looking for n equal to uh, capital N population size. And uh, for that, it has to survive roughly for time of order n. And according to this little calculation, um, the probability of that happening is 1 over n. So, uh, and uh, uh, in the neutral population, of course, that's pretty obvious. There is no difference between any of these individuals, so the probability of uh, taking over the whole population uh, basically has to be 1 over n. That comes out happily. Um, and the whole thing, you can generalize and uh, calculate uh, the stochastic dynamics for an allele with some selective advantage, let's call it S, and uh, you will find that uh, now beneficial mutations have uh, uh, non-extinction probability uh, proportional, well, actually equal to their fitness or sort of growth rate advantage. And once the number of offspring rises to a sufficient number that uh, then no, no longer likely to just be wiped out by extinction, then essentially the probability one, they're going to take over the population, unless something else happens. So, I'm, uh, questions? Okay, yeah. Uh, most certainly. <laughs> so, um, so let's take uh, let let's look at the process from another useful angle. So right now we're talking about sort of forward dynamics, um, but uh, it is very useful also to think about uh, the genealogy of a sample that uh, you may observe in uh, so the present day population. So think of this as a, a sample of HIV genomes. But, uh, but simpler still, let's just think of this uh, as a population and uh, now see what's happening under, uh, asexual, in an asexual population uh, as you look 
backward in time. So everybody has an ancestor, but some individuals are actually sisters, right? And uh, in uh, um, um, this constant, uh, in population of constant size, that basically means that uh, as the time marches backward, um, the number of ancestors uh, in the population reduces and uh, invariably goes to a single uh, most recent common ancestor in this very interesting uh, time to most recent common ancestor. And uh, uh, that picture immediately means that uh, there are correlations among the genomes of the present population, which comes simply from a shared ancestry not that far back in, in the past. So uh, for the neutral case, we know everything about uh, this coalescent uh, process called Kingman coalescent. Time to uh, um, most recent common ancestor, uh, basically twice the size of the population. Uh, the average time separating um, uh, any pair of the individuals is just half of that, and uh, so on and so on. All statistical properties are known. I think you've already heard about that. Uh, why do we care about things like this? It actually tells us a great deal. For example, knowing the um, um, coalescence time for a pair of, uh, of leaves immediately tells us uh, <coughs> how many genetic differences we have a right to, to expect, right? The mutation, so here I'm, uh, I start color coding mutations, so the probability that the, there is a mutation separating these two leaves is basically proportional to twice the time to their common uh, ancestor. Uh, alternatively, counting the total number of uh, different alleles in the population is uh, uh, simply, simply related to the total length of this coalescent tree, right? which gives us another way of uh, estimating a mutation rate in, uh, in the population. Uh, clearly, uh, mutations that occur uh, um, in uh, ancestors with uh, lots of offspring are going to appear at higher frequency. And again, by knowing statistical properties of the tree, you can derive the, um, the spectrum of allele frequencies that you observe in, uh, in this population. So this is, uh, this is very, very useful. The only problem with this is uh, uh, that actually statistical structure of a neutral genealogical tree is very different from a statistical structure of a genealogical tree in a population with a lot of genetic diversity and a lot of fitness diversity. And uh, uh, so the most uh, obvious difference is that uh, um, the time to most common, so th these trees are shorter. So even though I'm showing them here the same height, Actually, the time scale for the coalescence in the presence of selection is set by uh, the characteristic width of this distribution, basically set by root mean square fitness differences in uh, uh, this distribution, and uh, which typically would be much shorter than, uh, than population size. But, uh, but then uh, if you look in a little more detail at uh, this tree, you will uh, observe all sorts of other differences. For example, in the neutral tree, the first coalescence event, first coalescence events are, are, are the fastest. So the tree is kind of squished towards uh, lower branches and uh, very different in uh, uh, the tree under, under selection. And uh, there are also asymmetries in this tree. So for example, uh, if you look at different clades here, they're roughly um, comparable size whereas branching in uh, um, populations under selection tend to be very asymmetric. So, um, 
Um, this is actually one of the areas uh, that uh, that has seen uh, uh, a great deal of uh, recent activity driven uh, by statistical physics, and uh, some non-trivial progress has uh, uh, been made. So it turns out that uh, uh, quite uh, generally for uh, um, a rather broad class, or rather I should say broad, yeah, broad class of uh, uh, underlying models, as long as they generate a lot of fitness diversity, the structure of, uh, of the coalescent is uh, <coughs> so statistically similar to the to uh, uh, sort of the tree structures that uh, have been known in uh, statistical physics, um, having to do with relatedness of, uh, sort of different uh, uh, states of a spin glass. So uh, maybe uh, I'll scratch that. Uh, um, <laughs> So these guys basically have demonstrated that uh, there is a certain statistical universality in these coalescent trees that relates them to uh, a known class of coalescents different from the neutral one. And that, of course, is not the only complication. Uh, in the presence of uh, recombination, the genealogy is not a tree. And uh, um, right, people like Yun have been uh, struggling with uh, um, actually uh, reconstructing these uh, um, um, forests um, for populations with uh, uh, the presence of uh, recombination, sorry, for genomic data from uh, um, sexual populations. And uh, 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 very recently, we made uh, uh, so an epsilon uh, bit of progress there in uh, sort of relating the um, so the structure of uh, sexual genealogies with uh, the structure of uh, asexual genealogies for local um, um, patches of uh, the chromosome. Uh, Okay, so, uh, okay. Luckily, um, Oscar has already set up the conundrum for me. So let's go back to this problem of uh, uh, figuring out uh, how the rate of evolution depends on fundamental parameters such as population size uh, and mutation rate, in f so first in asexual populations. And Oscar described two different uh, limits. One is where mutation rate is very small or the population is uh, not too large, and then beneficial mutations come um, one at a time and sweep through the whole population sequentially. Uh, so. And then, of course, the rate of adaptation is linear in uh, this n times mutation rate, right? the total rate with which uh, beneficial mutations come into the population. Right? In a large population, beneficial mutations will occur in different genomes and will compete with each other. That's this clonal uh, competition story. And now there is this uh, much lower rate of uh, adaptation because different mutations compete, uh, and most of them get, uh, get wasted. And uh, then uh, the conventional wisdom, so this picture, so this uh, progress in understanding the case of uh, uh, clonal competition is remarkably uh, recent. So these papers are pretty recent compared to uh, the fact that this picture, I think, comes uh, probably from Kimura's paper. Uh, this is sort of a very classic picture, but now we're gaining a little bit more quantitative understanding of what's going on. So conventional wisdom 
um, going back to the classics, is that uh, in the presence of recombination, clonal competition will be relieved. And uh, perhaps the linear, so the fast adaptation will be, will be recovered. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. But, uh, um, and uh, remarkably, right now, there are experiments where one can actually uh, study this in detail and actually validate the uh, relevance of, uh, well, one actually observes that uh, um, in reality we very often deal with the, the situation where clonal competition um, and genetic diversity are actually important. So, um, uh, we would like to have the sort of general description of dynamics in highly diverse populations. And uh, I'm going to take uh, um, two minutes to uh, uh, present you with the following nightmare scenario, basically as a provocation. So, let's take any pair of us. And uh, I'm told that uh, we're different in about uh, uh, a million polymorphisms. And now suppose that all of these uh, polymorphisms are what I would call legally neutral, which is to say that whatever their contribution to fitness might be, it is undetectable, right? Which means it is smaller than one of the population size. Okay? So, again, I'm told that the relevant population size for humans is uh, 10,000 taken over sufficiently long uh, time window. So, now let's uh, do the arithmetic. So, let's say that uh, each of this million contributes 10 to the minus 4 to fitness, and some make this uh, tiny positive contribution, some make a tiny negative contribution. So, we have to add them up with variable sign, so it's sort of incoherent, diffusive sum. So the RMS of uh, the combined effect is going to be square root of a million times 10 to the minus 4. That's 0.1. That's a gigantic effect, right? So that immediately would uh, define a very fitness diverse population. And all this diversity at the moment is made entirely with uh, smoke and mirrors, right? Because by definition, we'll never be able to isolate this uh, uh, polymorphism and measure its contribution to, uh, to fitness. So, um, uh, if this, uh, so, right, you will uh, never be able to study this the way uh, molecular genetics uh, has been uh, um, done, uh, basically, precisely by identifying mutations with large effect and then studying everything about them, identifying uh, uh, the role of the gene in uh, um, um, in the pathway and uh, uh, perhaps even understanding um, uh, the effect this mutation has on uh, uh, the structure of the protein and uh, how that explains its effect in the pathway. So, right, never a single paper will be published about uh, polymorphisms like this. And that's sort of where statistical uh, physics view kicks in and says, well, uh, you know, we understand thermodynamics pretty well, even though we don't give every molecule a separate name. And sometimes, from a sufficient complexity, where you have lots of players that contribute very little, um, certain uh, emergent simplicity might come from. And, uh, you know, of course, this is a ridiculous oversimplification because we know that there are those large effect mutations. And, uh, uh, Molecular biology and genetics um, has been very effective at uh, 
discovering those, uh, those big effects, and uh, there, in, there is no escaping um, uh, those big effects. But, uh, but perhaps there is also this uh, underlying uh, mass of tiny little effects. And in uh, trying to disentangle the whole, uh, whole system, we have to uh, have a model of the collective effect of these lots of tiny effects. And uh, uh, at the very least, as a kind of a new null model to replace the neutral model uh, so that we don't think of the big mutations riding on the top of the neutral everything else, but rather big mutations riding on uh, um, top of uh, this nondescript um, uh, gas of uh, tiny little uh, contributions to diversity. So that was uh, my attempt to provoke you. And uh, uh, the next thing, I will actually uh, stop philosophizing and we'll start talking about uh, calculating little things. So I think it's a good place to stop. Right, so a lot of stuff have to go, so I think uh, people should just take off. And uh, you know, everyone needs to go get up and run. Don't worry about it. Um, but if people want to keep uh, oh, bugging okay. for questions, uh, go for it. You can also mob him and uh, try and take him out to lunch. <laughs> <laughs>